Hello and welcome to The Last and Deep, a board gaming podcast brought to you from three sparkling countries across Europe. I'm Alessio, your designated driver today, and I'm joined here by Cara. Hi. And Fen. In this episode, we'll bring the chill to three hot topics across the hobby. We'll experience a tournament at home with challengers, we'll see a definite amount of narrative gaming with Lens of Gertzir, and then a really hard to quantify amount of narrative with a summer popular tabletop RPG talk. But before all of this, it's time to see how everyone is going with our usual standee catch-up. Cara, how's your pharyngitis is going? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's going quite well, so I'm... I'm... Good. Yeah, I'm feeling not too sick. Um, so basically, it started two days ago very slowly. And since I'm a teacher and use my voice a lot, I decided ah, I should go to the doctor immediately. Uh, he took one look into my throat and said, oh, yeah, stay home until Monday. Um, so, yeah, um, outside of this recording, I'm not talking right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And about gaming? Um, still haven't gotten around to, to play a lot. I have played, like earlier today, uh, a couple of rounds of Lands of Galsia. Um, and um, yeah, and tomorrow I will, hopefully without too much talking, um, meet someone to try out the new Star Wars tabletop game, Shatterpoint, um, which I'm really curious for. Um, yeah, because I, I really appreciate that basically list building is super easy and done in two minutes. Um, something that, uh, prevents me from playing other tabletop Star Wars, Star Wars tabletop games right now, because I just don't have the uh, time and leisure to sit down for half an hour to an hour and build a list. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Looking forward to that. What about you, Fen? What about me? Well, I've just discovered I forgot to turn Audacity on, so... Um, oh! <laughs> you, won't, you won't have any part of my introduction. There'll just be a silence, but I'm here now. Uh, I was very entertaining, as you can tell from the others <laughs> laughing. Yes, very. It, was, it yes. was the greatest introduction ever. Yeah, I know. It's a real shame it's lost. But luckily, it's something that actually gets said a fair amount around this household anyway. So who knows, it might make another appearance. Uh, yeah, I've, um, well, I've been playing a fair bit of um, Blood Bowl 3, which uh, is the tabletop, I'm sorry, the video game, computer yeah. implementation of the board game Blood Bowl. Um, Blood Bowl 3 is the third iteration of the game which is made by Cyanide, uh, who have been forced to make Blood Bowl games because they made a Blood Bowl ripoff and Games Workshop went, hey, that's our game, we're going to step all over you, and they <laughs> did. Um, and uh, uh, I was almost going to talk about it during this episode, but instead I'll just talk about it briefly here. Um, it's been out for three, four months, I think it is. The new season dropped and um, uh, it's it's got like half the teams um, and they're very uneven, the teams that they put in. And the new rule set is really heavily bash orientated. And for those people who are not familiar with Blood Bowl, which I guess is like three people somewhere on an island uh, <laughs> Hi. i say being someone on an island um blood bowl is effectively a blend of american football and rugby um with street fighting on a pitch and uh, you pick a race you um build it according to a roster so you're allowed some positional some nor uh, like uh, the rest is filled up with linemen you might have like a really big dude on your team who's um dumb as rocks in most cases and uh, team play style varies a great deal, but it, a lot of it focuses around either um, bashing your opponents into the dirt or avoiding it. Um, and uh, the new rule set encourages that and it rewards fouling even further. So the game has pivoted even more towards being like a skirmish between two tiny battling war bands <laughs> dressed in bright colours, um, mercilessly crushing each other. And unsurprisingly, Games Workshop refuses to fix dwarves, which is a very, con uh, very like controversial area. Um, 
dwarf players in Blood Bowl are the most conservative individuals in Blood Bowl. <laughs> like by nature, play that they are drawn to the dwarf team, and the dwarf team is like a very controlling team as well. Golog um, bears. The trouble is, <laughs> the, 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 the trouble is, is they come with block, which is the best skill in the game. Every member of their team has it except for two. Um, they have a thick skull, which means half the time when they should be knocked out and off the pitch temporarily, they don't go off the pitch. And the real offending part is they have tackle. Now, tackle's a fine skill. It's meant to counter dodge, and dodge is a very, very good skill as well. And without that, dodge would be ridiculous. But it turns out having linemen, your basic bog standard guys, all with tackle, uh, is really oppressive. And as a consequence... The um, best teams are all like, they're either dwarves who are consistently one of the strongest teams at all stages of the game. No matter how far you go up, they only become bad if a load of other people play even more bashy teams. But those really bashy teams are terrible at low team value. They're like Chaos, uh, Nurgle um, and similar. And they and they get good because they get access to a claw which negates armor. So finally they can attrition dwarves. Um, so everything's rotating around the dwarf team now, and people are just kind of not willing to admit it. Um, but outside of that, um, it's been very enjoyable to play. Uh, orcs are stupidly oppressive at the moment, at the start of the season, but they do kind of fall off a bit as time passes. They have had some nerves. So yeah, uh, oh, there you go. It's a mini review of Blood Bowl Three here. Um, I guess that's mostly the most interesting thing I've been playing outside of playing more Apocrypha for the world, which I briefly gushed about in the last recording I was in. Um, and it's sitting on the table and I want to go play it some more now. <laughs> I have a question of one of the yeah. three people in the world who don't know Blood Bowl. No. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I just, you know, looked it up and you say something about free and there's a third edition. Are we talking about the one from 1994. No, um, Blood Bowl 3 is the video game, the third version of the video oh, game. Oh, okay. We are third talking about the no, no, no. no, what? Yeah, it, in physical form, <laughs> the nearest you get to it, I think it's Blood Bowl 2020, which I do have a copy of upstairs and I've never played because there's no Blood Bowl players on the island. It's the one with um, the passing separated from uh, agility. Yeah, yeah, which is, I think, a good move. But they also needed to split block apart and they needed to do something about the more bashy teams. But um, it's a work in progress. We'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll see. They get a lot more information these days because, you know, there's like a lot of people now are into playing Blood Bowl on the, um, on the Steam game version. So, yeah, yeah, I think that there are more people playing actually Blood Bowl on video game uh, than people playing the actual board game. Well, if if you include fumble, then yes, yeah, definitely. exactly. <laughs> I, I oh, speaking of which, before we get onto the actual topics, um, on this very front, uh, recently I got directed to a fumble thread uh, about because Blood Bowl Three has brought people into streaming it, and it turns out Blood Bowl's a lovely game to sit and watch someone stream because there's like challenges every turn there's room for smart play there's dice rolls there's emergent storytelling all of that kind of kicks in both within a match and across a you know a team's career you know there's highs and lows i i think we can say that kingdom death uh adam you know poots has played blood bowl because it, it has stuff in common i always um, say that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah there is there is definitely some stuff in common in my opinion uh, so it, it's been really enjoyable to watch, but um, your average Blood Bowl player, like your average one, is like a 50-year-old man who, um, like, if they play online, they play Fumble, and they're used to... Fumble's been, I don't know, it's like 20 years old or something now, at least. It's, it's been around a long time. <laughs> I, I think um, it's even uh, about between 20 and 30, because I think yeah, in 2001 it, it, it was played. <laughs> I think so. I think it's around the age of the internet, possibly. Um, you know, or the main, the main, like the main, generation Z. It's about a generation Z old thing. I think is the best way to describe it. Uh, anyway, um, so I wanted to get to this thread. Uh, they are, um, they're not used to their games being streamed. So occasionally, even now, fumble games are getting streamed, 
And they are very upset about it in some cases. They feel it's a violation of their privacy. <laughs> that, that Or, or um, they're like, oh, God, they're streaming and they're getting help from chat about how to play. And it's like, these are people who clearly don't have any understanding that when you stream something, you perform worse than when you don't because <laughs> yes. you're split between entertaining and actually trying to play and also you're like looking over at all the other little bits and pieces you have to keep in mind and all that setup and everything you know don't knock your microphone over don't don't don't, don't have the electricity fly off all no, that stuff. That... but it it, it I, I it was some of the stuff they started writing was really um ignorant and there was a, they, they eventually reached a point where there was an attack on gen z um, about this <laughs> uh, and i i was just like get used to it it's like if you play a game online now and Fumble records games and other people can register for the site and sit down and watch your games. So uh, it's a lot of misunderstanding. A lot of people now come into interface with Twitch and being like, what is this? Oh, there's this person talking to chat about what they're doing. They're clearly getting help. And then you look at chat and chat is busy, like chanting for an armor break and, or, or you know, <laughs> kill him, kill him, kill him, foul, 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 or, or stuff like that, you know. Or, or go on, pass the book. I know you'll only score on a six, but don't throw it now. Don't do the smart thing, just throw. Uh, so it's been um, it's been a wild ride, like going through all of that stuff and everything. Um, but ultimately, it comes back to uh, it's okay. Bubble three's okay. Um, if it comes on sale for about fifteen quid, maybe fifteen euros, I should say, give it a go. Maybe I think it's on sale um, right now for twenty three euros or so. I think that's a bit steep because the like single player content uh, is not great. The AI is pretty dumb, and bizarrely, uh, you have to play on a time clock even against the AI. Which I'm like, what? Why? I understand in a match online against somebody else there should be a clock. Why do I have the same time against the team? So when uh, is it completely pointless? Because if you have to do something, if you just force close the game. Um, when you come back on, it'll like load on a save state to where you are. So I'm like, why they put a clock on here? Anyway, um, yeah, uh, I've accidentally reviewed Blood Bowl three here in the intro. So <laughs> I'll stop. Yeah, it happened. So what about me? <laughs> yes, what about you? Sorry, I needed to take a drink. What about you, Alessio? <laughs> I don't care what you've been doing, but maybe the listeners do. Yeah, um, <laughs> let, 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 let's keep up this farce then. Okay, oh, I, I recently got a match at the, the Genie of the Lamp versus Harry Houdini. And I have to say, it has been the, the most fun I had from an unmatched set. Uh, in it's really years. fun. Yeah. It's really fun, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the cool thing about it is that uh, it, it is actually a, a, a user-sponsored deck. Uh, contest which uh, actually Restoration Games sponsored the contest which created uh, the set and the next one which is also extremely interesting so uh, uh, these are the winners of uh, deck uh, pitching contest basically and they are two cool decks with a kind of a common theme but thinking that there are in the Tomb of Solomon there are the Genie of the Lamp and Harry Houdini fighting to death is exhilarating and they play beautifully <laughs> yeah i'm very very excited about tales to amaze which we weren't allowed to back the kickstarter for because yeah. we're not in america what what are you doing but i've i've pre-ordered a copy as soon as it gets to sweden because i mean all right sure it's mothman who's a ridiculous like i think <laughs> most people's experiences with mothman uh, via fallout um, but he's an american cryptid yeah and a Martian invader, but it's it's a cooperative kind of boss battler, and I think the core unmatched mechanics are so good that I'm very excited to see how they translate it into a cooperative um, versus one big nasty thing. It could be a a whole new area for. Unmatched. Yeah, sh shame that Tales to Maids was uh, US only, but I did like you. I I just put a pre-order, and I hope it gets here soon. So. Uh, actually, uh, there's also uh, this contest also had uh, another two entries, which will be one of the next sets for uh, scheduled for this year, which are uh, equally beautiful. There's William Shakespeare versus Rosie the Riveter, and I'm v versus versus who? Rosie the Riveter, the the the, the 
poster girl from the second world war oh, yeah yeah right exactly. yes yes rosie yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, th- this is already interesting like that but uh, i'd love to just pitch uh, william shakespeare versus velociraptors so <laughs> I, I feel like maybe they should have put somebody else against william shakespeare like a bigger uh, contrast Spencer, yeah or or yeah. You know, you know. Then they could, it's the pen mightier than the sword. They could have had to brush across it. <laughs> yeah, the, the theme is a bit off, but it's like, well, it's always off. It's always like Cobble and Fog was the closest they got to a coherent theme. I no, think. I, I love Red Riding Hood versus Beowulf. They had the dog in That's, common. The, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 no, they don't. <laughs> yeah. Red, Little Red Riding Hood doesn't even kill monsters. She just gets eaten by it. Yeah, but it's this kind of silliness which makes a matched match. It, it, I, I think it's it right is. in the name, unmatched. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I know. It's it's been good ever since it was. Was it um, is it Star Wars Jedi Duels or something like that? The original system. Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, and uh, Star Wars Epic Duels was good, but That's I it. think uh, this new iteration is simply. Uh, actually perfect it's uh, an open system you can have everything in there so yeah one can hope maybe they go full circle and one day perhaps bring bring them back a few of the Star Wars characters I mean I would personally love to see how Jean-Luc Picard does against um, Sherlock Holmes <laughs> yeah Picard yes okay let's keep up with this farce again <laughs> okay uh well, I guess you're right. The new Picard series hasn't yeah. been great. Last season it was. <laughs> okay, let's cut this year before Kara gets a heart attack. I have no idea what you're talking about. That is fun. <laughs> uh, Fen is keeping mentioning Star Trek characters in Star Wars. I don't know the difference between Star Trek Wars and yeah, Star exactly. Trek Stars. Um, but if you want to talk about specific board games, I can, because I've played some of them. I mean, like recently, Car was talking about the Firefly um, board game. And my opinion is uh, Star Wars The Outer Rim is way better. It does everything, but better. But it's not there about the game, it's about the theme. The theme? It, it, right. <laughs> I don't think Firefly is a better theme than Star Wars. Oh, I... I... I d- Sorry, uh, it's not. It's not. One of them's still alive in a juggernaut franchise, and the other one is as dead as several like of the cast. Yeah, uh, the, the characters, I should say. The actual Western theme was not bad, actually. There's a bit of no, it was, redneck it was a good idea. vibe. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good idea, but it's it's a dead series. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Star no? Wars is, is also kind of like I, I feel Star Wars has reached a point where maybe it should just end. Maybe it should, but it's not dead yet. It is it, nothing ever dies, isn't it? Isn't that what they say? Yeah, nothing ever and, dies. And also, uh, Andor is quite is pretty good. Yeah, yes, Andor was yeah. amazing. Yeah, that I have to admit. That's. Yeah. yeah, it just turns out that the Star Wars universe is more interesting when you're watching like stuff that doesn't involve Jedi, which is why I think Picard's a great addition. <laughs> okay, <gasps> anyway, it's summer, it's time to watch series, it, it's time to play silly games like Beach Volley or Capture the Flag by the Seashore for the chance maybe of winning a free drink. So speaking of Capture the Flag, I think it's time to talk about Challengers. <laughs> Okay, uh, Challengers is uh, uh, actually a game pitched by One More Time Games, uh, most famous for Rift Force, actually. And uh, it's a game by Johan Skrener and Markus Lavitschek, and I hope I pronounced them right. And it's basically uh, a game of a tournament of Capture the Flag. Uh, you play it... Uh, uh, like a very very silly game but uh, this game has two things uh, going about it uh, which are simply extremely fun and wonderful I'll talk about them after I explain why the game is so silly uh, basically uh, at the same time you have all participants in this capture the flag tournament uh, challenge one of uh, one on one so you have one player with a deck on one side and another player with another deck on the opposite side there's the flag in the middle and you basically flip cards randomly from your deck these cards have a power value the highest power takes the flag when uh, 
uh, you have the flag, the opponent is challenging the flag. So he's, ba he's basically uh, flipping cards until the sum of all the cards he gets uh, are bigger than the value, equal or bigger than the value uh, on the single card holding the flag in that moment. When the flag is captured, the uh, opponent gets the flag on its last flipped card and all the other uh, cards from the uh, losing player get to the sideboard, which has a fixed number of spaces. When the sideboard is full, because you can place only the same cards with the same name on the sideboard, when the sideboard is full and there are there is no more room where to place your cards, uh, you lose. When the, you, can, you have to draw and you have no cards to draw and you don't have the flag, you lose. So basically this is the game and explained this way is pretty silly. There's uh, a game uh, like this uh, which is a popular kid game but like two or three years old kid. Uh, which is called the strappa camicia in Italian, uh, which is basically the same uh, played with poker cards. So you basically flip cards, the other cards take the others, and uh, who is left without card loses. So the game itself is very, very silly. But this game has two, two beautiful things going on for it. The first one is uh, the drafting. You know the cards. Uh, if all the cards only had the their uh, power as the discriminant, uh, they would be actually uh, very very limited. Uh, every card has special powers. Usually, you have cards with low power with very good combos, or uh, low power having good name, uh, all the same name, so that you can put them in the same place on the sideboard, so that they don't use up your. Um, your space uh, so basically uh, you are working to build up combos with your cards but since you don't decide which cards you are flipping because you are basically shuffling your deck and flipping uh, all of the game is in the draft and the draft is beautiful basically the game is seven rounds in which you uh, you go against uh, seven different games against the same opponent, against against a bot, against another opponent. There's a tournament schedule, which is the second thing uh, good for this game. Uh, and before each round of these seven rounds, you uh, can draft. And the drafting is, uh, you have a tournament schedule. Depending on the point of the tournament schedule you're in, you can uh, dec decide to pick a two low power cards or one medium power cards or two medium power cards or one high power cards and and so on. There is a, a lot of combinations depending on your tournament schedule. And uh, when you pick your draft, you can basically, for each card you can pick, you can draw five cards. And uh, once in all this phase, uh, you can decide to discard any number of them and... Uh, draw again and then you have to pick one or two or three or depending on whatever you have to pick. So drafting is actually very very flexible and uh, it's beautiful because the cards are so simple and with very simple powers that they are actually comboing pretty well. There are 10 sets you can choose from. You can put basically uh, four, uh, four, four sets at random from these 10 sets. So then you can have necromancers, skeletons, challengers like runners or cooks or rubber duckies or whatever, aliens, superheroes and whatever. And they all have their own powers. They are either low power with very good combos or very high power. And if they are high power, usually they either do nothing or do something against you. Uh, the draft is very, very interesting and it's, all, it's half the fun of the game. The other half of the game, which is, uh, I think, I think, I think, which is pure genius, is the fact that this is a game which when you play it, you feel like playing a serious tournament. Uh, basically, every round is fighting against uh, one opponent. This game 
goes for a player count of one to eight players. So with eight players, you have four fields full of uh, people playing at the same time, one against one. Uh, if you are playing a LAN, you are playing against a bot. And uh, then the rest, there is a tournament schedule for each number of player, basically. When the number of players is odd, there's always a bot against one of the players. And uh, it's beautiful because the way the competition is structured, the way you win trophies, you get fans and the following, and uh, you basically move and get better and you are pitted against someone who won a lot of trophies, you feel exactly, uh, or at least in my case, I felt exactly like uh, when I played in an Android Netrunner tournament when I saw, oh, this is the Italian champion. He has, he won a lot of tournaments. I, I did nothing. <laughs> oh, th this is exciting. So uh, the the game manages with a simple, uh, very silly board game. In in essence, manages to bring you the feeling of playing an actual card tournament, and I think this is beautiful. Now. Uh, a thing to know, uh, Challenger has a very whimsical feeling. Uh, it's uh, it has this. It is designed like a cartoon, basically, and uh, its components are pretty good. There is a very good insert to draw cards from, and uh, the play mats are neoprene, and uh, the cards are decent quality nothing uh, to write home about but they are pretty decent and uh, uh, the game itself has been nominated for kernel builders Yares this year uh, which is the let's say technical game side of the builders Yares nominees and uh, it's probably uh, for me it's my winner because it's a very good game i probably not candidate it him for uh, uh, for Kenner Spildes Yares, but uh, I know that games got simplified, so pretty fun. Anyway, uh, this is it, challengers in a few words. I hope it was clear. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was looking at it while you were talking about it, and I uh, I, I zoned out staring at the giant rubber duck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I, I think that my favorite is the knight, uh, because uh, uh, okay, le le let's say this uh, Challengers is a game which looks pretty silly because basically it's flipping cards and you say that's it, uh, what's my agency and whatever uh, I can tell you by playing a lot with uh, all kinds of opponents because actually this game gets played a lot uh, that in the end the most experienced players win uh, you always, maybe not the final winner, but the, the, the two players getting to the finals of the tournament are always the best players. So uh, there's a lot great going on for it. And that said, uh, I love the knight card because the knight gets uh, stronger, the stronger, the, 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 most, the more uh, your opponent won trophies. So it's a great card for the final battle. Otherwise, the, the alien set is really crazy. The fantasy set is great. There's the wizard, there's the necromancer, there are the undeads, there's the jester. Basically, you got themes. Uh, you get people from the city, you get people from the space, uh, you get the carnival team, you get fantasy team, you get dinosaurs, that's basically everything. Okay, so it says this game is one to eight players, but you said it's like two players. No! So how exactly yeah, does that work? Yeah, exactly. It's played like a tournament, so basically you are, uh, uh, it's one to eight players because when there's an odd number of players, you add a bot so that the players are always even. Then couples of players at the same time challenge one on one. At the same time, you have four boards playing at the same time. There's a tournament schedule, and you go. Uh, you basically 
uh, decide your opponents because the 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 fields uh, the parks are color coded and uh, you know like oh my second battle is in the red park and you fight against whoever is in the red park at the time okay so uh, i guess talking about blood bowl earlier was relevant then it's a bit <laughs> like doing that except in a shorter time front time, time frame okay <laughs> yeah okay and uh, if there are no questions J just one how much of a dud is the bot? Uh, yeah, that that co that's cool because uh, uh, the bot can be uh, regulated for uh, difficulty. You have four levels, and the manual has uh, uh, rules for adding uh, levels other than four, so it can be as difficult as you want. Uh, I, I can tell you that the level zero of the bot can be actually uh, bested by kids because my kids regularly play against it when we are not the number of players and we are usually three playing. So uh, it's very good. I played up to level four and I managed to beat it, but I never played higher difficulty levels. Okay, all right. Well, that's, that's good that it's got scalable difficulty, so that gives it solo play ability, and you can also run a tournament with a bot tuned as difficult as you possibly can manage it, <laughs> and be like, good luck everyone, good, uh, everyone can fight for second place. Enjoy, this is what the future's going to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, I, I don't recommend it just for solo game, because... Uh, uh, I think the biggest thing this game is going on is the fact that you feel like playing on a tournament and uh, when you have to play one or two players you are challenging the same opponent for seven times not even the bot so uh, it's not as fun as playing in four or six so basically I'd recommend it to play in four already four players they are already a great player count uh, three players is great if there's someone who wants to, uh, to to actually take care for the bot uh, but uh, one or two players there's probably something funnier because you, you are getting this to play a tournament and it's pretty good at this but the game in it itself is still a simple game okay so i have one more question it's i'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this or not say theoretically for this example group size is between one and four because that's what the other game goes up to uh is this going to be better than baseball highlights 2045 i don't know the game you don't know no. it okay well i'm i'm gonna have to review it sometime in the future because <laughs> okay. it's it's really good, but it also has a great solo mode. Okay, well, that's just that's, that's for another time, then. Okay, so... Uh, that be it? Yeah, I, I think we can move out from crazy and inventive tournament matchups to get to crazy and inventive campaign world building. I think it's time for Lands of Galzir. Woo! Yay! Oh, okay, um... I'm immediately going to take Umbridge at Inventive. We'll get back to that, and it's not necessarily <laughs> criticism. But this is a very old style of game. Um, and I will touch on that when we get back to it. But it has its roots in uh, 1985 or earlier. Anyway, this is Lands of Galzia from Sammy Lasco. Uh, he's a Finnish designer, so I might have butchered his surname, but I'm not going to try and pronounce it in the Welsh or Swedish way because that wouldn't work. Uh, it came out last year, and it is a one to four player sandbox story game. So the difference between a sandbox story game and like a normal story game is your normal story game is sort of kind of on rails in that while you have decisions you can make along the way, you're sort of following a fixed narrative. A good example of that would um, be role player adventures which is really good um, but it is effectively playing through a bunch of preset stories that you make decisions along and the narrative can change uh, as you get there same thing would be legacy of dragon hole this on the other hand um, is far more a collection of different stories and vignettes put together uh, and it takes place in well it says lands of galzia but uh, the the place is Daimyra, um, and I think Dale of Merchants, and there's another game as well that was set in yes. the same setting. Yeah. 
Um, so you will take step into the lack of boots of one of four different characters um, who are anthropomorphic um, animals. They're, they're an ele- eclectic bunch, for sure. Uh, you've got Keridai, the northern banded newt, Isala, the river kingfisher, Moor, the frilled lizard, not the god of Ooh. death, and, <laughs> and Bamir, who are the... Um, the marked polecat. Um, and each character has their own sort of different set of traits, uh, which is a, a fun little system that's fairly easy to operate. You have a dial on your character board with a bunch of punch holes in it, and you can either have none, one, or two of these like semicircles in there. Um, and they each color represents a different kind of thing. So you can be, if you've got lots in pink, you're good at stealing. Uh, orange is a sword for fighting kind of physical stuff. There's a survival skills, knowledge, uh, conversation, touch, and perception. And additionally, in a rather fun way, each category color um, also has a little bit of a splash in the two colors to either side of it. So if you're good at stealing, then those dice are also going to give you some benefits in being perceptive and fighting. So uh, there's a, a night you can be good at a number of different things. You can actually cover quite a broad selection of categories if you just want to be a jack of all trades. But your characters will start focused with two in one and one in two others. And events can change that as they go around. Um, so that's kind of what the characters are. Uh, and I wanted to talk about them briefly before getting into the actual game itself. Because uh, a lot of the game happens under the hood, so to speak. Uh, so the other limitations of your characters, well, they'll have some gold, which is a little dial that um, you use to keep a track of it, which makes it easy for packing away because these are persistent characters from one session to the next. And you've got three slots for items and an infinite number of slots for companions. Um, and you're allowed to hold up three quests. So anyway, you'll pick your character. Um, you'll put out a nice little mat and you'll set it up that there's like a bunch of starting quests Uh, You'll have a couple of starting items um, set to you. You'll have a starting personal quest to follow through to give you some direction and set up initially and add a little bit of character to your your particular avatar in the world. Um, And then pretty much most of the game happens on the app because physically on a turn you will move up to two spaces and it's, it's basically node systems. There's a bunch of cities where the main thrust of stories happen uh, and they'll sometimes you'll be going to them or you'll be going to places near them and then uh, the rest of them are kind of like randomized um, nodes of a certain flavor or feeling and depending when you land on it you'll draw an event card and you'll have something happen which can vary based on location day of the week is one of the things that can change it so essentially this is a game where you move a bit You draw a card uh, or you look at the board and pick a number and the person who's been your storyteller for the turn enters those into an app and will read out the story to you. And you sometimes make decisions, you sometimes make checks and some narrative stuff happens to you. Uh, Might change the situation for you or um, maybe give you a new quest or a new direction or you'll meet some characters. You get little vignettes of the world. And essentially that's more or less it. The big thing to note is um, this game has a lot of cards as well. Uh, They're set up in what's called a library. And at the very moment you first get the game, there's a set of instructions to follow to set up the game. Do it properly. Um, Don't cut any corners because if you get it wrong, you will cause problems for yourself in the future. And you need to be quite strict about keeping the cards in the right places. Um, But the, uh, the nice thing about the app, which I liked, is... Everybody can have their own copy and, you know, like either download it on their app or they're accessing the website and it's able to, it, it doesn't like track anything on the app. Like, it, so you're just referencing a load of stuff, but there is a lot on there, uh, which means everyone can have their own device. You don't have to pass a book around. That is pretty useful and they have supplied a copy you can download. Uh, a session as well is pretty good in that... Um, and I'll talk about some of these later, but uh, so some of these story style vignette games can get very long. We're talking like three hours a session. This one, 
uh, you can you basically play like in little chunks, a number of days, depending on the number of players. Like you could be playing for a week, maybe, or less than a week. And at the end of it, you'll all meet up and have a little like, um, how's everyone doing? And if you're playing cooperatively, you'll be asked check how well you've done on a given score. If you're playing competitively, there can only be one who gets all the glory and everything. Uh, or solo, you know, um, you just get celebrated or uh, or not based on your achievements. Um, like my wonderful achievement of um, not getting squashed by a rock, which is the best thing I did in one of our sessions. Uh, failed to climb a mountain, didn't get squashed by a rock, failed to climb up a tree, decided to not bother it to speak into this person who might have been very interesting because I didn't have any relevant skills. And I was like, I don't I don't care that you're doing archaeology. I know nothing about archaeology. I go in dark places and steal things. That's all I do. Um, so, yeah. And then when you get to the end of that block, you'll have your little wrap up and then the game can go. Do you want to have another go? Like another game now? So you can play like multiple games in one sitting because um, it's not particularly long and it's very breezy and easy to use. Uh, as I said, I front-loaded it by talking about skills because that's my favourite part of the game is the skill mechanic. Um, these skills relate to dice. You'll normally roll five dice. They have one of each different system, sign, <coughs> one of each different symbol on them, on each face. Uh, hence, there are six different skills. But the specific ones have um, double skills for your particular uh, forte and then they have a couple of skills with the adjacent ones um, it's all like nice and easy it's a very much a pick up a quest and go somewhere and do things or just bumble about having adventures just whatever do what you like and that can be a bit much for some people but for someone like myself who just enjoys prodding systems and picking the dumbest thing possible to do to see what the consequences are hence why I fell, failed to climb a tree a mountain and nearly got squashed by a rock all within th two three days of each other um, it's it's quite delightful. Uh, thematically, it's beautiful. Uh, it's super easy for someone to play. You literally, you know, you can bring somebody new in to an existing set that you've already been playing in for a while and go, okay, well, you can play one of these two characters. They haven't been played yet. They've got their little starting story. Off you go. Um, and they're like, well, what do I do? And you're like, well, just make decisions. Go places, see things, and and have a, have a nice time, which... Uh, I think is quite nice and uh, all of us have played this so I'm going to open the floor now to a general kind of discussion um, because I as I said I think mechanically this game is very light and accessible yes definitely I mean um, I have start the first time I played it was in August last year and um, I played it on stream and then I haven't played it until today and um, so for reasons which are kind of stupid now in hindsight, I didn't take it out again. And now I thought, ah, well, we, we'll be talking about it, so I should, you know, refresh how it works and everything. So I took it out and I thought, okay, how do you do this again? I opened the manual and was like, all oh, right, you move, you pick a number and you follow instructions. That was it. So um, I hate, normally I hate app dependent games um, but first of all I think it's great that they don't really it's not an app it's a browser it's a website uh, you can download it you don't even need internet connection during the game um, if you've downloaded it on your phone for example um, that's great and I mean it's just it, it's I, I love it it's it's so relaxing. It's not what I was expecting at first. Um, I was kind of expecting more, you know, character progression and uh, learning new stuff and whatnot. Um, and that's not happening here. Like it's, you have your character and you can modify your character, you know, during a, a story uh, as a reward, you might be able to move one of your four skill points basically to another skill, but that's it. You don't get more skill points. You have a maximum of three items. So if you get new items, you have to replace other items. It's not like, oh yeah, you know, when you reach a higher level, you get more powerful items. No. Um, in my games today, I actually 
was at the point where I noticed, okay, I've gotten so many items now and all of them I just threw away because I was just happy with what I had. And um, the ones I got were not stronger, not particularly weaker, but I was just happy, you know, with how my items uh, were spread out in their usability. And so, yeah, it was fine. And in the end, my character wasn't really different than when I started. Um, I haven't moved any of the skill points because I'm happy with the skill loadout of my character. And um, so it's, it's just this nice, relaxing, I sit down for 45 minutes, uh, play a little, see something from the world there. And um, yeah, and also, you know, let myself kind of uh, take away from the story because I, my second game today, I start with, oh yeah, now I have these quests and I want to start there, go there and do this. and. On the second day, uh, something happened that led me in a different path. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, then I do this now. And um, so it really has this relaxed, no pressure, um, adventurous feeling. Just, you know, I'm out there walking about, seeing the sights, meeting people, um, having small adventures and... Uh, returning home to the inn and tell people about my uh, achievements. Yeah, um, I, I was, you just reminded me of the first time we played and um, uh, we both had our introductory stories and we got put on the map and my partner immediately started following um, the quest line and I instead went, oh, I'm here, I'm going to go in this and... Um, uh, my partner was like, but you've already been in there. That's where you were when you started. Why are you going back? And I was like, because I can. I, well, I don't need to rush off and find out what this MacGuffin is. <laughs> There's this here. It's dark inside. I've got a lantern and a bunch of keys. Um, although we'll talk about the keys in a second. Uh, I'm going to go and explore. And I did. And I found some throwing stars. And I was like, cool, great. Now I'm this um, adventurous little ball of mischief with a lantern and some throwing stars and some keys that I thought I, I looked at them. And I was like, all these do is you can trigger them when you're involved in an unlock situation, which I thought that makes sense. They're keys. They, they work during an unlock. But all you do is you roll the D12 in the game four times. And when you get a 10 to 12, you stop and you get four prestige points. And I looked and I was like, okay, prestige points are like an indicator of how well you're succeeding in the game. But effectively, all I do is I'm in front of this locked door or this chest and I pull out these and I go, look, I've got this handy set of, of keys to help with burglary. And it's like, well, how do they help? I jangle them a bit and I look through them and I go, look, shiny keys. And everyone goes, ooh, and I go, I'm very prestigious now. And they don't help me pick the lock because that's what my skills do. So despite the fact that they generated prestige points and actually generated the lion's share of my prestige points for that particular session, I ended up throwing them away for an umbrella because the umbrella looked cool and I could fight with it or I could do some other things with it. And I was like, I'm just going to have an umbrella. and It doesn't make prestige points, but I don't care because now I've got a lantern, an umbrella and some throwing stars. I'm like some kind of... Um, I'm like short round from Temple of Doom. Yes, please. Yeah, I now say something which connects to both what you've said. And it's a, a very specific point of view about this game. Uh, basically, I have kids, kids with grabby fingers, who like uh, one of the two is pretty decent in English, so he's playing narrative games now. And uh, they basically take over all my campaign games, all my uh, sandbox games, and they play. And Lands of Garnsir is one of the very few games which allows me to actually enrich the experience when they do. And this is beautiful. The persistency of the world is beautiful. I, I think uh, I got, yes, like Kara in last year's summer, I played it a lot back then and i think uh, i arrived uh, early this year then uh, in the meantime i had kids playing uh, there are the beautiful thing is that they played a few weeks possibly a month and after that when i get to replay 
something has persisted, something else has happened, and the world went on. And this is basically a beautiful feeling in games like this, because you don't get to experience this much, this feeling in a lot of games. Probably the 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 game or, or rails which get close to this are probably the the uh, like sleeping gods. I'm thinking uh, the way you, yeah, yeah yeah I was going to mention sleeping yeah. gods as an alternative choice, but sleeping gods is more urgent. I think. Yeah, it feels like there's time pressure in sleeping gods. And while there are time mechanics in this, like my partner had a set of newspapers that were only relevant for five days and then got thrown away. I feel like you could just... I'll get round to whatever I'm supposed to be doing in this a lot more. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that there's room for both because basically what Lands of Galaxy does is to leave you a game which progresses every time you play and leaves you something for the next time you play. Uh, for instance, I think last play, last time I played more the Thriller Lizard, uh, I think more put uh, like a sawmill on fire, if I remember it correctly, and uh, I forgot about it, I just uh, took it as a general role-playing game, Petty Revenge, and uh, I recently uh, stumbled into an event an event where uh, I was assisting people who got burned and were dying for the from the from the burning sawmill. So actually, the the the, the war persists, and it basically there are cute animals, but not everything is cute in this world. No, no, it's it's a bit more serious, but that's not surprising given like one of the other games is Peacemakers, which has you. Um, cooperatively trying to um, uh, bring about peace, you know, it's called Peacemaker colon Horrors of War. So it gives you an idea that there is a acute veneer to everything, but there, there can be serious subjects going on mm. within this. Yeah, um, yeah. For example, I actually encountered some some story. I had a, had this quest, you know. Oh yeah, catch these criminals, and um, so I, I went looking for them, and I found them in like a hidden um, camp in the woods, and. When I approached them, they were like, oh my god, no, we are found, what are we to do? And it's like, wait, but aren't you hardened criminals and I'm just an adventurer? Why are you panicking now? And it turns out, yeah, they are like some political dissidents who, you know, some scholars who uh, write pamphlets and books about the um, current system and economic system and how it should be more... Um, uh, have more an, of an emphasis on equality and whatnot and i'm like okay you know what i'll help you find a new camp um <laughs> so um yeah there are these more heavy sub topics in there i actually haven't you know encountered any war or whatever yet um but i, I really yeah what you said this persistent world it's just amazing uh, in one game today yeah. i was at this place where they were like oh yeah we want to build this uh spa thingy whatever in the wilderness and didn't have enough people to help work and i was like oh yeah i can chop down some trees for you and uh, help you win over some investors and in the next game um a quest where i had to escort someone on their travel to a theater or something um i came through where I earlier helped them with the spa building and I was like hmm now there is a spa I want to <laughs> check it out I want to see what I helped build and um, I had the option to do different activities and it ended with me uh, showing kids how to tie some cool knots and a kid being appreciative and me getting some prestige points and that's just that's what I love about this game. You have this persistency, uh, you, you change the world, you have these... Uh, it's, it's just cute and it's fun and I want to yeah, play more. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, if, uh, to provide like uh, some additional bits and pieces, first of all, there, yeah, like you said, there's some elements that will change. Uh, there's actually a section called the vault where you'll like archive some stuff, either temporarily or permanently, so there will be alterations. Um, 
months change from one session to the next. When you pack the game away, you'll be ending that particular month. You'll be going on to a new month. There's two sides to the board, a summer and a winter side. And there's some variations in what they're like as well. So, yeah, it's... it's um, I... I, it is very much like a wandering around having an experience type game. And I think it's at its best with a smaller number of players as a consequence. Because unless you're super into sitting and listening to other people's stories and having fun because they are also engaging in a fashion that's maybe entertaining for you also, um, this might be a better experience as like a couple or as a parent with a, a child or two. Um, but it's... I really like there's apparently six novels worth of stories in this game so uh and i think the writing is is pretty good um yeah sometimes it is clear that um english isn't their first language uh that's actually not a criticism it doesn't mean it's, it's badly written it's not it's just as an english native speaker well semi-native my actual native tongue is welsh in cumbrian beth um uh but uh I actually mispronounced that then because I'm mispronouncing everything today. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's um, it, it's got some idiosyncrasies that uh, like tripped me up a little bit, and I had to reread the sentence to be like, oh, this is what it's saying. Um, but the car- characters are delightful. The world setting is a lot of fun. I will say it's a bit of a shame that um, when you're using the app and you're reading, if you're playing multiplayer, there's little sections that are like when it's a gorilla or a squirrel, there's like, you can click on it to pop up a little window and it talks a bit about the given animal. That's like far more engaging playing solo because if you're playing multiplayer, you're not supposed to be looking at the book at all. You're meant to be making decisions blind as you know, based on what the prompts the other players have read to you are. So, um, it, that's like a, a little bit of a, a difference in the experience. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I wanted to also... Like this is a this is an 80 euro game. It's available right now. But I wanted to talk briefly about a few alternatives um, as well. So I already mentioned role player adventures. I think the mechanics in role player adventures when it comes to trying to resolve skills is that's more of a game. It's a dice based game where you're trying to achieve like Yahtzee set Emmy ish, trying to achieve certain objectives. So if you don't mind the fact the story is on rails and you want a more robust system where you can even make your own characters because role player adventures lets you play role player to generate your characters before going on an adventure with them. That's a possibility. Um, we also mentioned Sleeping Gods, which is a bit more sandboxy, but as I mentioned, I feel it has it has more time pressure in it. I always feel like I don't have enough time and then I'm going to have to do like the roguelike loop again. And I didn't feel like I was getting uh, as much once I got like four or five sessions, like four or five campaigns in, whereas Lands of Galzia at the moment... I, I don't know when we're going to hit a repeat of anything. It feels like it's going to be a long while, so that's pretty cool. Um, but the other two options that are very close to this um, is uh, the original, which is Tales of Arabian Nights. And that is like, that's the 1985 thing I referenced. It yeah, does, I suspected that. It does land the Galzia from the start. And there was a... 2009 version um, which i own and it's um modernized it to a certain degree uh it's not available except on the secondary market and it's going to cost you around the double of lands of galzia uh there's a lot more in tales of arabian nights as to options to what you can do basically you'll like encounter a a grand vizier and it'll go do you want to talk to him do you want to fight him do you want to run away from him Uh, do you want to steal from him um and a load of other things so it has far more options but it feels less coherent, um, which can be its benefit and maybe a drawback as well. I've, uh, very memorable stuff happened like in one game of Arabian Nights we played. I did what I often do and I encountered said Grand Vizier and I went, I'm going to steal from him. And everyone went, you're bad at stealing. Why are you doing this? I was like, I don't care. And I stole his flying magic carpet by pure chance. And I spent the rest of that entire story with him cropping up time and time again, trying to get it back off me and causing all sorts of problems. Um, that was super cool, but you're looking at like th- two to three hours a session with Tales of Arabian Nights, whereas I think um, Lanza Galzia, 
you could possibly get done one two player a whole game session inside an hour hour and a half maybe yeah one I mean, hour. That, that's um, something um i i have only played it solo and mm-hmm. solo i need less than an hour for one session yeah in, yeah one hour and a half seems yeah. about right for multiplayer yeah. Yeah. yeah, I noticed the scaling for number of players is like, uh, I think it's it's like eight days for one player, and it's down to like five days yeah. for four and players. And basically, I mean, I, correct me if I've got it wrong, but basically, every player turn is move, resolve a story. So yeah, move, move, do a story. If you are one player, you have eight days, so you resolve eight stories. If you are yeah. two players, you have seven days, so you resolve fourteen stories, almost yeah. double the amount of one player mm-hmm. and, and it yeah. goes up to 20 stories with four players so two yeah. and a half times so i would expect with four players even we you know with uh, okay who does what uh, discussion in between that you are getting to two and a half to three hours with four players yeah yeah exactly exactly um yeah so the the uh, Tales of Arabian Nights has a similar thing where it's quite a bit faster when you play with less players for the same reason, but I don't think it ever gets as fast as Lanza Galzia does. Lanza Galzia's like system is so stripped down in clever ways, and so much of it's packed into the app just to get it out of the way that you're not passing around two books and a grid table to work out what's going on all the time, which is great. Um, there's another option which came out just recently that I'll probably talk about in the future, hopefully. It's from Everything Epic, who are the guys who made the absolutely brilliant Big Trouble in Little China board game, um, which sadly is out of print. Um, it went out of print so quickly they couldn't even re- replace my box, which arrived damaged. That's uh, a shame. But anyway, Agents of Schmirsch is... Um, it was a 2012 game originally, I believe, and it is, uh, you play globetrotting spies, um, super spies, all that kind of James Bond, sort of man from uncle kind of um, stuff. And uh, you just, you have a, a particular villain plot to deal with and you'll um, play as you explore around the world and have little vignette stories and try and become good enough to take down the boss. So that one has more of a focus on the end, but it is back to... A lot heavier on what you're having to handle um, so it's not quite so suitable for younger players there's like a gigantic encounter book in agents of schmirsch um, which of course schmirsch 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 which also isn't in lands of galzia lands of galzia like is so it's so light and easy i even managed to put the dice tray into the main box um, and it, you know i can just take a box and the roll up the map because i like the map on neobrain and that's it um so those are the other options uh if like they're all within the same mechanics and there's destinies which we talked about in the past but destinies is a great system but badly implemented with terrible stories uh forgotten waters i think we've talked about as well um another variation on this storybook system but that's more party orientated and silly and of course seventh continent which um, has its issues. So I think of all of these, Lanza Galzi is probably the best of this genre that I've played. Um, but I'm kind of excluding Sleeping Gods there. Um, I mean, basically, if, I... You, if you want a story with interaction, Lanza of Galzi is great. If you're looking yeah. for like an actual game, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, that's the thing. I don't. There's there are miniature fail states in Lands of Galzia, but uh, I never got the impression that you're ever going to be put in a position where the game goes and your character dies. I don't think that's remotely yeah, I did an option. Think either. Yeah, yeah, which is fine. Actually, it's fine. Um, I mean, it's great to have something like that that you can play with younger people and they can experience some stuff that's a bit like, oh, that's this is a serious topic, but engaging it in a kind of like not particularly harmful way um so that's pretty good and if you like the setting but you don't like uh the concept of this game dale of merchants is a very good deck building game in the same world um and i would also like recommend that for a look at um also i love deck building games it's very good so that's uh that's lands of galzia and i think overall um if i was gonna say i think it's a seven out of ten game for me Maybe seven and a half. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I figured both of you were going to score it slightly higher, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's fine. Uh, I I like I've I had a good time with it, and I love the mechanics, and I think the skill mechanics and dice mechanics are great. Um, I my score rating might go up more the more I play it, um, but like based on a few sessions worth of play, it impresses me. Like I am very impressed with what it's doing, um, and how well put together it is. But it impresses me more than the experience. Like it excites me. It's cozy. It's definitely yeah, cozy. I think is the term <laughs> I look for. Now, okay, we are done then with. Uh... Freeled lizards and newts uh, and uh, some cats, something. Uh, pole cats, maybe. <laughs> pole cats, yes. Yeah. And it's the. Do not forget Bummy, eh? Yeah, the, the, I, uh, the, the Kingfisher, right? <laughs> no, Bummy is the. Pole oh, cat. the Pole cat, Fisher. yeah. Bummy, okay. Yeah. Bummy, yeah. 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 Uh, or or Bummy, Bummy as we call him yeah. while I played him. Yeah, the yeah, we, we, uh, I have this uh, damn Italian accent. So, <laughs> whatever. Uh, now we can talk about sa- about stuff like Mind Flayers, Beholders, Git Yankee, and everything else which is usually copyrighted without repercussions because we are actually about to talk about it. It's time for Kara to talk about some role-playing game, I think. Yeah, so Dungeons and Dragons. Let me start. You know, I started role-playing games with Dungeons and Dragons uh, somewhere around 2004, I think, uh, when some classmates were like, "Hey, you like video role-playing games, right? We might have something for you." And uh, so I ended up in in the the room of a classmate uh, sitting there and um, playing a ranger and. Um, they were like, hey, and what do you want to do? And I'm like, oh, yeah, my ranger will go to the uh, innkeeper and ask them um, about what's going on in this town. And they all looked at me and said, then do it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so that was my uh, first, uh, s- that were my first steps into role playing games. Um, and yeah, and I've played D&D um, from then on and off until basically like a month ago. Um, I mentioned it in an in last or, or second to last episode uh, that we finished our uh, long-standing campaign, um, and I kind of wanted to talk about D and D because it's such a great influence on me. I had so much fun with it, but I also hate it, and. Um, <laughs> Or let's say Me too. I, I've grown to hate it. Um, when I first started, I, it was amazing. Yeah, you know, I, I've always watched these fantasy movies, Lord of the Rings and, and whatnot. I, I can't even remember what uh, all the things I watched. But um, and I played these video games, you know, I, I played Neverwinter Nights, Baldur's Gate and um, Star Wars uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Um, And I didn't really get these games. Um, I mean, they were fun, but I I didn't really understand the mechanics until I started playing D&D and I was like, oh, wait, that's the same mechanic. (laughs) And um, so, yeah, um, it was great, you know, just diving into these worlds, um, having fun with friends, meeting each week, uh, wondering what our game master has prepared this time and all the the running jokes we developed over the years. Um, For example, um, one time when I um, uh, DM'd the group, um, there was the situation where uh, the party decided it was a good idea to attack a big uh, military convoy, uh, basically like four people attacking 120 people or so. And I was like, are you sure that's what you want to do? Yeah, yeah, sure. That's a good idea. And I, okay. And um, so when it was the, the, the army's turn, um, I you know just clumped them together and I had this uh, enjoyment of letting arrows rain on my party. And um, <clears throat> so when it was my turn, I was like, okay, it's raining arrows again. And years later, uh, my friends are still quoting me and 
um, when in some game, you know, there are arrows and an arrow gets fired, it's like, oh, it's raining arrows again. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it was amazing. And, um, and then we reached higher levels and, um, it was really apparent in this last session of our campaign, um, where it became really epic yeah, and it was a really fun session and a great finish for our campaign. Um, we were in, um, this, uh, Dale where, uh, evil organization was about to take over and, um, we uh, tried to help the people and started inciting, uh, uh, an uprising and, um, and it all led to these, uh, uh <clears throat> clashes that got, uh, more epic each time. And there was this one time, so, okay, now they took some villages and want to, um, uh, make an example of them, you know, hang them for the treason. And we were like, oh no, we can't let that happen. So we, um, confronted them and basically I, I played a wizard and I dissolved or disintegrated the leader of the enemies in the first turn and then the dwarven warrior um, cut down the two trolls in the first and second turns and we were like damn we grew powerful right and <clears throat> and it ended with the, the, the final fight where um our druid summoned some air elementals that just trapped the enemies and the enemies, if they got out, they got trapped immediately after again. And then our uh, game master was like, um, how long do they stay? And our druid looked up to, oh yeah, for the next 10 rounds. And she was like, okay, you win. Um, because it was the point where we are, yeah, they can't do anything against us. And it kind of shows part of my issues with D and D. Um, when you get to higher levels, it kind of turns into this, whoever casts the first spell wins because spells become so powerful that, um, yeah, they, they finish a fight immediately or, or you have the exact counter spell to this spell prepared and cast. So the spell fizzles out and then it's your turn to hopefully cast one spell that the enemy is not prepared for in this moment. And, um, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it just isn't much fun at this point anymore. So, uh, we resolved a lot of things in this last session with, oh yeah, you want to do that. Yeah. You managed to do it because you are so freaking powerful now. And, um, <clears throat> I still think D and D has, uh, is a great game for, you know, getting people into the hobby. Um, I have to say I've only played D and D 3.5. I know D and D five is so much better and everything, but every time I talk with people about what's different in D and D five, I have opinions. It ends, <laughs> uh, yeah. It ends with me saying, yeah, but it doesn't change anything about my criticisms, does it? <laughs> so, um, I mean, it still has this power creep. It still leads to in higher levels, a fighter has no reason to do anything else than just attack because that's the most powerful thing he can do. And, um, yeah, so not sure in how far I would be more happy with the Indy five. Um, but apart from that, even in lower levels by now, I have to say, I don't particularly like D and D for myself because D and D is an arcade role playing game. Basically, you know, it's, um, you want to go into dungeons, kill monsters, loot stuff, level up. That's D and D. If you want to do, you know, real character development, have interesting stories, um, with twists and turns, um, have characters that actually have a certain depth built into the system, that's not D and D. And in the last years, I've encountered so many other amazing tabletop, uh, role-playing games and, um, 
I'm really hoping I can convince my group now that we finished our D&D campaign, we are thinking about, okay, how do we continue? And they were like, oh, we could start D&D 5. And I'm like, no, please, please, please. There are so many great systems. Um, so I offer to um, DM uh, some one shots in different systems. And I'm really thinking about which systems they would like the most. So I basically have a hit and they say like, oh yeah, that's what we want to play now. Um, and yeah, so I actually started kind of collecting tabletop RPGs by now. Um, I think previously when we talked about Kickstarters, it kind of, you know, uh, um, was noticeable that I back a lot of tabletop RPGs or backed, well, I backed one this year as well. So, um, and <clears throat> I don't really get to play them as much as I would like. And that leads to some uh, something maybe interesting for at least some people who are listening um, because I decided I want to actually can say that I have played all of my role-playing games at some point um, and not say oh yeah of my 20 tabletop RPGs I've played five or so um, so I am um, thinking uh, close uh, getting to planning um, to offer some uh, one shots for well uh, listeners and members of this podcast and um, there I don't have many more details at this point but um, I have to also uh, point out I'm really bad at organizing with people and um, it's super stressful for me, so I'm, ah, and, um, <clears throat> but basically if you say, hey, that sounds kind of interesting, looking into different tabletop RPGs, uh, maybe looking at some indie games um, and whatnot, um, and you think, oh yeah, Kara is maybe not the worst person I could imagine um, <laughs> being a game master for a role-playing game, um, you should maybe join our Discord and, um, you know, just uh, say hello, mention, oh yeah, that sounds interesting. Um, I'm, I'm willing to um, be maybe available if the time is right. And we'll go from there, basically. That, that's great advertising. You, you, you know, <laughs> la, la, last week I was playing La Pasión de las Pasiones which is basically a tabletop RPG about soap operas. You are, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's beautifully trashy. <laughs> I, I don't think I will ever play another session again, but it was an intense three sessions. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's very, very difficult to pin a game which spent basically 50 years and counting, like D&D in all its iterations so you you did a pretty reasonable job to 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 a pretty good job actually <laughs> I, thank you thank yeah you. no i am a computer programmer so i'm you i'm used to be very sensible with compliments so <laughs> so that, that's it but uh, the only thing you can do is possibly to 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 talk about how you feel playing a game and yeah, I, I think I got a grasp of what's your experience with D&D. I, I just, since you mentioned that you only played 3.5, I, I just want to mention one little thing because uh, uh, last year I DM'd a, a fifth edition uh, short campaign and uh, uh, basically my thoughts are yours, meaning that D&D uh, &D is a great uh, introductory game uh, which is focused on mechanics so uh, for whoever has never played an, an entirely narrative RPG uh, this is great because uh, it gives you a pause from ab abstraction you can see your chapter sheet and you can see something which is oh, okay this number means that if I hit my, with my sword I will do this damage 
uh, with this probability and that's great mm -hmm. because it actually means that you can hold on to something if you think uh, one of my favorite game system of the past which was uh, don't rest your head when you have basically to describe what's your madness trait and uh, uh, roll a few dice to see how much you succeeded and then you basically describe what happened or the game I'm playing now, which is Fabula Ultima, where you basically spend story points to steer the game the direction you want. Uh, these are a bit more abstract systems. Uh, you start from D&D. And then, if you are interested, if you like it, you go on. Uh, one thing the 5th edition does pretty good is to make it akin to a board game. Uh, I'm saying this in air quotes because 4th edition was probably better at it, but 5th edition uh, is very streamlined, very simple and very combat focused, meaning that uh, I, I don't like a lot what happened to the master manual and something like that, because I remember the Beholder from 3.5 which was actually uh, a very fearful monster with a lot of stuff to do and a lot of lore and a lot of a lot of going on for it uh, while now basically a combat with a beholder is still very powerful but it's just uh, rolling a dice and see which kind of saving throw you have to do because uh, you'll get damage anyway and that's it so basically it's mechanically focused which means lower levels and starting learning to play, you will be fine. When your numbers are high enough to, to, to beat most of what's the challenge in the game, you are done because there's not a lot more to incentive to play except the, the world building your dungeon master does. And usually the dungeon master is good at world building anyway, whatever the game platform is. So that's basically the, the richness and the big limit of Dungeons & Dragons. That's it. Right, so uh, I thought I'd chip in as well. Um, I'm a uh, lifetime GM, is the way to describe it. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, in the length of time I have tried being a player in role-playing sessions, I have found exactly one person who could GM in a way that didn't cause me to be incredibly disruptive <laughs> and, and and unhappy with what's going on. Um, I just... I'm, I, I like... Um, by nature, I like switching around to a lot of different things. It's part of what I like about board games, is learning new board games. So I get bored. I don't want to play a character to a super high level. I, I want to experience some story and um, slipping into different NPCs. Just that's the perfect fit for me. So I enjoy playing different characters. So GMing. But um, in addition to that, uh, I didn't even start with D&D. &D, um, and I, I've... I'm on record, I think, even on this podcast to say how I dislike um, the use of a D20 as a mechanic yes, for rolling. Yes. It, de it devalues skills so much because it's a flat, like the variance is flat. There's no bell curve. And it's weird because Dungeons & Dragons started off using 3D6, which gives you a value between 3 and 18 and clusters around 11. So your skills became more important because you were like, yeah, I know what I'm going to roll. Um, but obviously rolling 1d20 streamlined everything you don't it's easier you can look at the number and be like that's what the number is um so that makes sense but my, i think my favorites uh, are actually the percentile systems and specifically call of cthulhu and call of cthulhu's fantasy version which is literally the design um pitch for it warhammer fantasy roleplay and what's so great about those, especially in Call of Cthulhu, your character can improve a bit. They can get a bit better at like doing specific skills, but they don't really level up. Instead, if you successfully use a skill during a given investigation or chapter of a big long campaign or whatever, then at the end of it, the GM will be like, OK, now everyone can roll to see if they improve their skills. So you have to have used the skill in the campaign and then on top of that, when you're trying to improve it, you have to roll over your score. So you have to fail the skill check to improve once it comes to leveling. So it means the higher your skills get, the harder it is for you to get better at them because you have less to learn. 
um, which is kind of nice, but it also keeps characters very flat. They don't get super like bonkers powerful the longer they're around. In fact, they tend to deteriorate the longer they're around because um, their sanity drops and their max sanity drops as they learn more about the horrors in which they live in um, and everything. Uh, and also the very game itself lends nicely to investigative role playing where really skills are just there to supplement it and many Cora Cthulhu um, and other like horror based role playing might not even end with conflict because you're around a corner and there's a shove off and it's like um, uh, can you fire a shove off <laughs> no no I'm I'm a newspaper reporter I think we leave and that's really like nice and interesting but it's it, re it requires you putting aside a character ego you can play a really fun character like we've had some very notable characters through the years i've gm'd call of cthulhu um but the most famous ones died and it's the way they died that like leaves them so famous because they they just did crazy things we have we still reference at times charles mandu who was a stage magician who turned up very late in one campaign we were running because he was a replacement for a cat burglar who thought hiding from a magic tornado inside a bush would work. Um, that was the player's decision because he felt that was the correct role-playing decision his character would make. Even though I said, I'm going to roll a d100 for how many points of damage you take and the man could take 15 points of damage max. And the guy role-playing said, no, that's what my character would do. He would hide here. And I was like, good luck. I hope I roll low. 73, no, you are pink mist. Um, but yeah, Charles Mandu was like, he, he just turned up. And the very first thing he did was he found himself somebody who completely deleted his, any aspect of his um, mental capacity for sanity entirely in order to exchange it for a ton of knowledge about things beyond the border. And then he decided it would be best if all of these strange artifacts the group had collected were in his possession, so he could then ascend and become a new god. Um, and, and that's where the campaign ran off to. He died. Uh, he, he died very... Uh, he died saving everyone else. Not that he wanted to, but but um, they were all tied up, and uh, one of them like broke free and was under a lot of time pressure so he untied Charles Mandu and threw him at the creature to buy enough time to untie everyone else which was fantastic so that's a possibility is games like that and Warhammer Fantasy role plays an interesting bridge between the two because the whole pitch when it was first designed was Games Workshop turned to the designers and I think I've mentioned in the past I used to go to university with a nephew of one of the two designers um, uh, Phil Gallagher um, anyway, you, they said to the designer, that's my name, just casual name drop, means nothing at all. Um, <laughs> uh, but I did give me a chance to chat with his nephew a bit about the background of what's going on. And they were told, hey, we like this Call of Cthulhu thing. Can you do that for us in the Warhammer world? But can you make it a bit more like D&D? &D? Which is uh, why Warhammer lands in this like spot between the two games where it's got combat and you can fight things and win. But you never get to completely a complete victory. You can't ever overcome everything because the ultimate foes are the Chaos Gods and they're like living concepts in many ways. It's sort of what you're going to do against the Lord of Change, uh, Zench. Like nothing. He's he's going to continue to plot and plan and seduce more people into following his um, convoluted plots to just undermine the world for as beyond your lifespan. Um, but you get little victories along the way. And it's a nice step between the two uh, with enough classic fantasy elements. And it's an IP that's pretty uh, well known. There's also the 40k role playing games, um, which are a whole wide variety where you can be as minimal as a like a, a, a member of an Inquisitor's retinue. Where effectively you've got a guy with massive authority who says, right, you lot go to this place and sort this out and don't upset me because I can have you all tortured if I really want to or fed into some machine or disposed of. So it's um, it's very like interesting as well. And ultimately, and I'll get to my point because I've been very long winded. We in our role playing group have hit on um, a thing where we rotate around between several different campaigns and we do a little bit at a time. So currently in Call of Cthulhu, we are halfway through the complete masks of Nahalatep 
and that's on pause. In Warhammer uh, Fantasy Roleplay, we are halfway through the Enemy Within campaign. We're about to go to Middenheim, which is my favourite campaign book of any campaign ever it's amazing it takes place over two weeks and it is so thick and dense and it is entirely dependent on what the characters do as to how things are going to pan out which is amazing they have massive like loads of um like freedom uh, uh, to to do what they want but there's a timeline and things will happen if they're not getting involved you know where everything's going to go. You know where everyone's going to be at all times. It's wonderful. And right now, as a break, we're playing 7th C, uh, which is very Indiana Jones, red line, travel to this location, have this strange, cool thing happen, travel to this next location, have this thing happen. And it's in a pseudo-fantasy Renaissance Europe. Um, 7th C is very swashbuckly. So that's like, it works for us because we kind of rotate around and... Um, that way you never get characters to be too powerful, but also I'm very prone to, I get to a certain point and I go, okay, that's it, we're done. That's the end. And that's what I think is important, even in D&D, is you have an arc and you know where the end's going to be as a GM and you get to that and then you stop. And if the players are like, we want to play more D&D, um, you go, okay, well, you can play in the same world as a different group of people taking place after this timeline or if you want, we can jump forward a generation and you can see what's happened to the world in the period in which we've been, like, uh, between. So you can maybe see your old characters and what became of them. Um, and But they're not adventurous anymore. Maybe they're the ones handing out the quests uh, and so on. So, yeah, it, it, every role-playing game, I think, needs to kind of have resets. And if those resets are not built in through um, death of characters or forced retirement of characters... Um, then you need something else to reset it. Otherwise, like, you end up with, um, uh, what you call it? It's um, uh, Dragon Ball Z, where, like, what, what's left? You've punched out the most powerful being in the universe. Now it's time to punch out the most powerful being in the multiverse. So, yeah. I, I yeah. think it plays exactly like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd rather um, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, where you finish one character's story and then you move on to the next generation and see where the world is and what's happened next, which is pretty interesting in itself. So yeah, that's uh, that's my tabletop role-playing experience, or some of them. I've played a lot of role-playing games over the years. Um, the only role-playing games I own that we haven't played yet are Root, which has just had an electronic uh, release, and Fablecraft, which is a... Um, it was a Kickstarter electronic role-playing game, um, and I've decided to back it to talk about on here, but I'm going to be doing it as an experiment as a player rather than as a, uh, as, as a GM, which will be fun. But I think with like being stepped away and using it via a client electronically, that might help. And the person I've, off I've asked to GM, I think I, I've, I've kind of been teaching him how to how I GM, he's been learning from me. Um, uh, not that I was deliberately trying to teach him at first, but he was like, oh, I've learned so much about GMing from you. Um, that's been really helpful. So I'm like, okay, I'll give you, you, you don't annoy me. I'll give you a shot at GMing for me and maybe it'll ruin our friendship. But yeah, yeah. Tabletop role playing games, you could probably talk for hours just about them. Okay, I think that with this, we burn through all the time we have today. Okay, as usual, you can catch up at uh, patreon.com slash thelastnd, subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or iTunes, or Amazon Music, or direct download, or whatever medium you use to reproduce out your tracks, actually, or join our Discord to chill out a bit and have a chat and ask Cara to master your sessions. Until next episode, uh, goodbye from Fen. I found the keys to the Jeep, and the listeners are not going to get that joke, because I wasn't speaking at the time, or recording. Cara. Bye. And myself, bye. We have been The Last and D, and remember, the second E stands for estate, which is summer in Italian. <laughs>